So, welcome everybody. Um, it's really nice to see you all. Let's start with a quick introduction for someone who needs no introduction. But for those who are still curious, Peter Fenton is the longest standing GP at Genchmark. And he has backed epic companies such as Twitter, Zora, Airtable, and Elastic, to only name a few. As such, he's also a perennial member of the Midas list since 2007. I'm Jeanette, I'm a founding partner of La Familia, a pan-European venture firm, picking the best founders at seed. One of our biggest wins were Deal, Personio, Forto, and Applied Intuition. Let's dive right in, Peter. It yeah. feels like every week something controversial is happening in this industry. You've been on the board of Twitter for nine years. What do you make of the current situation? Is this a recipe for positive transformation or for destruction? You know, it, it um, is a company, most people here I assume are on Twitter, have points of view about its future, and um, you know, it's a company that has always felt, to me, like it would outlive all of us. And you know, in a venture career, you know, you try and get your company public, and very rarely do you brush up against something that feels like Wikipedia or um, you know, for that matter, people have compared it to email. So, so Twitter has this sort of um, uh, inevitability feeling to it. And, and we tried, I invested in 2000, early 2009. I know Evan, Evan's here. And um, we did our best to build a business around it. And we inherited a number of, um, I would say, pathologies and culture. And, you know, we, I, I witnessed three CEOs 15 heads of product, uh, I could go down the list of, we shot it in every major organ and we didn't kill it. Um, and that part of that is the humility of being on a board and saying, you can make a lot of mistakes and still have a company survive. And, and the question with Elon, which I think is ultimately a good one for us to witness in the industry, is a fundamental A-B test where, how do you change culture is a big question for companies once they've gotten past that first formative stage. Um, we always say that culture gets formed in the first, you know, two to three employees. And, and at Twitter, the culture change required needed it to go through something cathartic. And when Jack took over as CEO, you know, the change was, I would say, incremental. And I think Jack wanted to change it fundamentally, but, but he didn't. And so with Elon coming in and saying, half of you are gone, there's a completely new reality and all that, um, I, I almost think it doesn't matter as, as much as we like to have the great man theory, maybe not in Finland, but in, in the United States, we have the great person. I, I think it could be anybody that just said, half of you are gone, now let's just do more stuff and see what works. And we're likely to see, I think my instincts are that we're gonna see major areas of opportunity and growth amidst the mistakes which people can point to. But, but my sense is that, and I, I have a bet with my partners, you know, in five years, is Twitter going to be worth more than the NASDAQ at the close of the transaction? And my strong instinct is it will be. Uh, and not, not because Elon is a great man, but because the underlying possibilities of Twitter haven't really been manifest. It, you know, it, the last thing I'll say on this is when you invest in a company, you kind of have a genotype of the company, and that leads you to have a theory about the phenotype. Like what, and Twitter was blessed with, I think, a $100 billion, maybe a $500 billion dollar genotype, and our phenotype was a $30 billion. It didn't feel very good. Mm. You might think, oh, it's Twitter, everyone knows. No, but, but the potential always felt an order of magnitude more than what we were manifesting. So the, the stories of today, the echo chamber of the valley, are all the mistakes that will be made. But you know what? Twitter should be making those mistakes. And, and we were so guarded and defensive and closed that Elon coming in and disrupting it, I think, is one of those... those uh, there's, Jeff Bezos is a large investor in our fund, and um, we had a conversation with him about the style of leadership that Elon brings. And you can point to all the things that he does that are in the, what you don't do as a manager. And, and he's sort of, their book written, there'll be books written about Elon's management style. I, I think that a little bit like Steve Jobs, you know, it's not so clear you should emulate it. In fact, it violates many of the tenets of, uh, what people would say is good general management, but the thing he gets right, and I think ultimately Twitter is gonna benefit from, is to have radical aspirations 
and, and leaders set the horizon of the possible. And I think Elon will do that for Twitter in a way that it needed. And he's done that for the comp Tesla, obviously, SpaceX. And so that, that, that line of what's full potential Twitter look like and then having radical faith and then, and then telling the team, well, that's the target. Um, oftentimes, if you say that, you know, people laugh at you and they're like, well, that's just delusions. It's not visions, it's hallucination. But, but I think there's, there are people, and Elon is one of them, um, who say it in a way that then reimagines what's possible for those people showing up to work every day. And it's a gift of his leadership. And I think it's one of those things that, that Twitter will, will benefit from. And I don't know, my, there's a, there's a, there are other sides of the bet that I made in our partnership, so <laughs> I could be wrong. But it's interesting, right? Most founders only emphasize the upside. I think he said very clearly we could go bankrupt if we don't get this right. I think it's an interesting... Well, you know, it, and I think that's part of Elon's magic where it's... Um, I don't share his value system. There's a whole bunch of things that he's done that I, I, I wouldn't do, but, um, you know, activating the individual sense of the possible also requires you to recognize that you're in the spine of a mountain and you could fall off either side, but that you know, that's what Twitter needs more of today, then it's going to be okay. It's all, there, there'd, be, there'd been a learned helplessness inside of the company. And I think by, by shocking the system, it activates a part of the organism that, was, that had laid fallow. So. Mm. Speaking of culture, which you mentioned earlier, jumping from one bomb to the next, mm. FTX, what do we make of that as an industry? You know, it's, it's, it's such a uh, tragic story. I, I think the, you start with a sense of, me at least, compassion. Some people start with shame and judgment, and that's suitable here too. But, you know, what happened was um, the runaway train. And I think if you look at Enron or other situations where people get into this kind of trouble, it's funny, when you look at the, the, the pathological behaviors, very rarely does someone start out as a sociopath fully developed. And I'm not saying SPF's a sociopath, but you, you, know, you, you get involved in the market, you take risk, you get validated, you take more risk, and then it compounds towards insanity along that road. Now, it happened relatively quickly with SPF. Enron, it took, took a while. But those people I think are, Theranos is probably the closest, Th most Theranos, recent Theranos, example. I, I think Enron may be an even better example, not, not to say that there aren't parallels with um, the personality type, um, they're, where, they're, where the highest parallels are is in governance. And I, and I think when we look at FTX and we look at what happened with SBF, you say, um, well, where is the board and the, oh, there was no board. Mm -hmm. And where are the, and, you know, we were involved with uh, a couple of companies that were of, sort of gained notoriety in the last generation, we work in Uber and served on the board of both those companies. And I think we had personality types that um, brought governance into the foreground. Usually governance is in the background. It's like a shared space of trust that you have that we're not doing this for me or for you, we're doing it for the common shareholder's purpose, the purpose of the business. And, and in, in the case of both WeWork and I think Uber, it's now well documented. Governance became front and center, where we were in conflict with our with our entrepreneur, which is um, sacrilege for us because they're the reason we exist. So to go into and those both those cases were highly stressed. It's well documented now. I don't think that happened with SBF, hmm. and I'm not sure it happened at Theranos. And hmm. so, you know, in in in, in many ways, you know, if you don't subscribe to free will, and most of us don't. Um, you know, the system that SBF had created gave them the outcome. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think as, as fiduciaries, you know, we can say, is the system, does it carry the integrity of what we want to do to be there for the founder? Mm -hmm. um, we're all parents. So we just, I have five young children. You, you have a few yourself. And um, there's, there's a, something you learn in parenting, which is false empowerment. And I've done it. Like, I've not, like, this is really, no, it's not like wrecking six billion dollars, but it might be staying up all night with an iPad. <laughs> and so, mm. am I to blame when my child is, you know, use the iPad all night? I kind of am, because I didn't set the boundaries that I didn't, and it's, these aren't fun conversations. They're not the easy path in a relationship. But if we don't represent that in our industry for these companies, then it's not that we don't, we let, we let that individual down, we let SB, the SB, next SBF down, and we let the fiduciary responsibility that we have down 
And it's, and it's a tough thing to work on because, you know, you, you, we talked a little bit about the great founders. You know, how different is Elon from SBF or, or from, from Elizabeth Holmes? It, and one of, the, one of the stories that people struggle with in this era is, well, that person's good or bad. Get rid of, my view is, get rid of the labels of good and bad. They don't, they're, not, they're not honest and dishonest people. They're human beings, and we all are fallible in many ways. Um, and that fine line between, and I think it's finer than I, we're willing to admit, uh, projecting a future, in, inviting people into a shared hallucination, which is most startups, versus telling a lie. And, I, you know, I think, the first lie for many of these people is the relatively easy, uh, and then it compounds. And the next thing you know, you're so far down that path, and this happens in, in geopolitical systems, it happens in companies, and of course it happens in, 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 in individuals, uh, that, that at the end of that path, it's sort of unrecognizable relative to where it started. Mm. So, so, they, so I think some of the narrative today that, oh, SPF was a bullshit artist, he was a fraud, it's like, it's not so easy. And in, in all of us, we have those aspects, particularly entrepreneurs. When have you crossed the line? And I've been there. I've been there raising money where we're, you know, we're, we're telling the downstream investor, we, you know, you're telling them a story. Mm. And that story has a lot of risk associated with it, which you, you tend to suppress. And um, now, the governance thing, the systematic governance thing, I think is in a very, it's an acute, common thread, causal, I think, you know, with, with what happened at Theranos and what happened at, at FTX. Um, but versions of this are going on at most companies, which is mm. like, you know, all oh, the board governance, it's all that boring stuff. But, but, but that but, dance is important. But I think that's an interesting question, right? What makes for a great board? Because you mentioned previously that yeah. boards are just very ineffective, and I would agree with that. Like, what would make for a really good board meeting all through the life cycle of a company? Yeah, I just, I had a, um, the pleasure of sitting on a Docker board meeting when I got here last night for five hours, or actually three hours, but felt like seven, seven hours. And um, that, that, that uh, Docker is such an interesting story. Now, maybe you, if you aren't developers, you don't know Docker. If you're a developer, you have it on your desktop. You know, there's 15 million people have Docker. Um, to me, the story of a great board is told through a company story. So Docker had a gilded board. We, we, you know, we had representation you know, from all the major firms, and Docker 1.0 was a total disaster. We wrecked about 300 million of investor capital. We set records for like, you know, uh, uh, ineffectiveness, uh, negligence, all those things, and surprising that I didn't get fired, but okay. But, but that to me was, was a board in dysfunction where there were a lot of cooks in the kitchen. I think there was a big sort of a committee mindset, lack of clear vision. Um, and the worst thing that a board can do, I think, uh, you know, th there's the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. In this case, we, you know, the board came with lots of ideas and the company, I think, engaged with them and we weren't firm on the governance side. But the thing which I would tell you that, that a great board has and that board didn't have is radical faith in the company when you most need it. When you least need radical faith is when things are going well. And, and Docker 1.0 went from the hottest company in Silicon Valley to a total disaster. And we lost most of our investors. The quote board members just left. And I refuse to leave because when, when we commit, and I think this is the nature of venture, uh, it's an existential commitment. It's like founding a company. It, it's in a way like having a child. And in my book, you can't unparent a child and you can't unfound a company. So one of the most important attributes when you're selecting a director, I think, is will they treat you with that kind of unconditional love and radical faith when you least feel like it's deserved? And, and this is true in parenting, when you most need to love your kids, that's when they're the least lovable. So if you have a director that doesn't manifest that, you, you're, you're just injecting risk into your company. Because when, when, when shit goes wrong, and it inevitably goes wrong, then the true colors show up, which is like, well, they weren't really here to back me, they were here to make a quick buck, or they were here because they had a different idea for the business. And so I think the pre, like a ground condition for a great director is radical faith in the, in, and by the way, belief in you more than you have in yourself. Mm. And it's one of the things I've tried to do in the venture business, and I've been to, we've all been to the board meeting, you're like, oh, I made a terrible mistake, what have I done? But there, there's this great lesson in happiness where um, people are much happier when they have fewer choices. 
but they're even happier if they've made a choice and they feel like they have no way out, like they have to make it work. So uh, when you've made a commitment and said like, this is like being a parent, mm -hmm. I can't unparent this child. <laughs> I can't un I unfound this company. Um, no. That's, that's a big Kierkegaard question, right? Yeah. And, 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 and so in terms of flourishing of a board, the last thing I'll say on that is that um, you know, I had one of my CEOs said to me, none of you responded to the pre-read and you didn't put comments on that. And I said, I, I don't want to have the meeting before the meeting. In a great board, there's something that happens, collective effervescence, I don't have a word to describe it, but when a group of minds come together fully present and they're, they're talking about your business in a way that opens up your horizons around what you might not be seeing. So I think of a successful board meeting is when the director says, or the, the CEO says to me after the board meeting, actually I don't like this because, they, oh, that was a really useful board meeting. I'm like, ugh, you know, better that it was useless and we just showed up because everything's working. But when it's useful, there's some revelation that comes out of the dynamic, the dialectic, mm -hmm. that wasn't possible in individual one-on-ones. Mm -hmm. And I would say that happens one in a hundred board meetings for most of us. Mm -hmm. and, and, but it's, it's, it's incumbent on the CEO to create the conditions that let people have a dialectic in their board meeting. Most board meetings I've experienced are slide decks, presentations, updates. So at all my board meetings now, I said, none of that stuff, everything should be a pre-read. And if we can have 80% of the meeting be a conversation, now, a lot of CEOs say, I don't want to have a conversation with that group of bozos, <laughs> which is the average board. Okay, then curate your board. But mm. sorry, that and was a long answer. What is the most controversial advice you've been giving your founders in this crisis? I think everybody has been sharing the get 24 months of runway type advice. But what is an advice that might be really insightful that you've shared that others may not be aware of? navigating this crisis? Yeah, the controversial question, I wonder, you know, what becomes um, conve non-conventional becomes conventional very quickly. Um, I would say six months ago, I said the economy is going through a cancer, not a flu, because I think inflation is more like cancer. It, it, it takes, um, it metastasizes. And we've been exposed, I got in the venture business in 1999, and we had a flu, the internet bubble. Then we had a flu in 2008, and we had a flu around COVID, I mean, a terrible analogy, but this is cancer. So it, what, I, what I suggested is that, you know, the way to think about it pathologically is that the problem will start to compound and get worse, as opposed to be acute and, 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 and localized. And, and so my, my theory in the, in the spring, and I was pretty, non-conventional at that point is that 2023 is going to be a 20 to 30 percent down in the S&P and probably another 30 to 40 percent down in the NASDAQ and nobody wanted to hear that and well look our numbers are good we don't see any of this stuff I'm like huh, you know we know what inflation is like and you could be healthy and have terminal cancer you could I've been doctors say I have it but I feel fine that's what we were like in the spring now we're starting to show the pathologies and and I think Q4 has been evidence of that Q3 numbers were mixed it was like half the companies missed their numbers uh, I think in Q4 it's going to be more like two-thirds and so so the controversial advice I guess I'm saying now that's not conventional wisdom conventional wisdom is don't raise money for two years don't run out of capital um, cut aggressively cut now uh, in a way, by the way, Elon, by cutting half of Twitter in seven days, this is the controversial advice, which I'll get to in a second, set the pace. Because, you know, I mean, conversations like a week before that, when I was talking to people about making cuts, they're like, well, we don't want to go first and 10%, we'll do performance reviews. And that was the people thought Stripe was going to do a 10% performance review cut, which isn't really a cut. And they went away, but they doubled that. So. The, the, Steve Jobs came to Yahoo. Yeah, I talked to an executive who was at Yahoo in the middle of their failed turnaround. And he said, you know, when I came to Apple, I had to, we were going to run out of money. We were going to go bankrupt. So I had to cut. I think it was a third of the employees. And so, so we, we didn't have a good way to make the cut because I, I hadn't really been there. And I didn't, I didn't know how, most of the people. So I just, I just looked at the people who were there before I got fired. And I said, we're not going to get rid of them. And then we're going to get rid of, like, randomly get rid of half of the other people. And, and he said, you know, I, I overthought it. What I should have done is just taken, this is going to sound reckless, but I think this is the advice that I give it, and it is reckless. So I should have just taken a random number generator and spread it through my employee registry. And then if you got the unlucky number, you're fired. 
Uh, and he said, that, that would have been an easier way to do it because you don't, and then John Donahoe shared this advice with me about eBay when he turned eBay, and he did turn eBay around. Um, great people in a broken system are gonna be broken in terms of their contributions. So when you're making the cuts, cutting 10, 20, 30%, in a way, if it's random, it'll hurt a little less if you're the employee that gets tagged. <laughs> um, but, but don't overthink it. And okay, you have your bottom performers and you have people who are deeply loyal, okay, I get that, and maybe you're extraordinary performers and they're visible. But if the rank and file, you know, those cuts I think have to just be made in a way that's quick and decisive and, and don't, don't overthink it as much as that sounds cruel and I don't think you do it without compassion. The other thing which is important, I think if you're gonna make a cut, you're messaging to the people that are leaving with your severance and the words you're sharing, but what you're really doing, the customer, when you're letting someone go, is the employee that stays. So they're, they're seeing how you're treating those people as a proxy for your values. And if you, if you treat them carelessly and with negligence and all that, you're bankrupt, you know, because the people at the company that are left are not gonna trust you, and they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the human side of it, if you don't really internalize that and you just make it an, a, you know, a cold business decision, I think you could lose the culture's essential human core. Mm -hmm. I'd love to shift perspectives for just for the last couple of minutes, and this is more for advice for fellow VCs in the audience. You said something recently that actually makes me think we're kind of two, two people in like parallel universes where we would have been philosophers or artists. You yeah. talked about a poem being most similar to or the authenticity you're seeking in a poem being very similar to what you're seeking in entrepreneurs or companies at the early yeah. stages. And I actually used a similar analogy in the past where I said like artists are a lot like you know, similar to entrepreneurs, and that when you look at an early stage company, it's a little bit like looking at a Picasso drawing, right? There's no paint, yeah. the bird doesn't look like a bird, but they're kind of the early innings of a new language. Can you maybe elaborate on what you, where you get this poetic kind of authenticity moment with founders when you first meet them? Yeah, part of it is, um, I'll lose the audience, but poetry, unlike uh, prose, I, I think expands our perception of the universe because of its breaking from the norms of discourse. And in a great poem, and I'm a huge, I love Wallace Stevens' poems, uh, Borges' poems, uh, I mean, we all have our favorite poets, but when you read that poem, it slows down time, it expands your understanding of the universe in a way that changes it. It, it doesn't, it's not like, well, I just read another point of view. You, and, and so when a great company, when a great founder comes in, I felt this about Evan, I felt this about Travis, and, and even when, in his own way, Zuck presented the Series A when I was at Excel, uh, it has that, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it feeling, and you know, it changes your eyes in a way that, um, it, it's arresting, it stops, like, and it's so funny, I've done this job 25 years. The people that have been like, the manifestation of a great poem. I remember every part of the meeting, the first time I meet Evan Spiegel, I remember the smell of the coffee we were, you know, it, it, so, and I think one of the things about time is that it's, it's experienced in your memory differently because you can have many tracks, and this is the neurologist, you know, description of why does time slow down during an accident? Well, time doesn't actually slow down, but you're recording more information. So. Mm -hmm. There's something about a great entrepreneur, I'd say this for investors, where the, um, the slowing down of time, the expansion of awareness, and then, and then its density of truth that, that you feel in um, reflection on those moments is rare. What's crazy about our business is I can spend, unfortunately, three years, four years, and never feel that way. But I gotta invest, I gotta fund, I have partners, I feel like I gotta be productive. And, you know, I remember meeting Nicola at So Rare, and it's weird, because usually you know about three minutes in, it's, and this is sort of weird in the sense of, okay, well, you have to do due diligence, you have to ask good questions. But when you hear about, like, okay, trading cards, fantasy play on the blockchain, and then Nicola expresses it in a way that's so pure, 
you just sit there and think, ah, oh, okay, well, that probably won't happen again for another five years. I should enjoy this moment. <laughs> and so. Amazing. Peter, I certainly enjoyed this moment very much. I think so did everyone. I could continue this conversation for hours, and hopefully we get to do so afterwards for coffee. But thank, thank you guys you. all for listening, and thank you, thank Peter, you. for these incredibly valuable insights, especially in times like these. Thank you. Thank you.